Welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're here. We brought the sunshine, brought the blue sky. The wind was not ordered in advance, but this is what we're dealing with right now, aren't we? So this is the first program, um, and I hope you all who live in Southampton received a, a postcard with advertising of these programs that are supported by a neighborhood outreach grant through the D DCR, which is a state um, organization. The town um, was awarded a grant that allowed us to um, do all, the, all that was necessary to put on these programs, and we're really pleased to see people. We're doing these, of course, in this time of COVID. We appreciate your being separate here, but we're glad and want to say thank you to East Hampton Media for filming this and allowing it to be um, posted on their YouTube site, East Hampton Media. And that was, in the, that was in the brochure as well, so you can spread the word that this is available to be seen. Um, in addition to saying thank you to East Hampton Media, I also, hold on here, I wish to say thank you to Adele Donahue. She's not here today, but she is the graphic artist that created that um, postcard that you all received, that colorful one. I would show you a picture of it, but I think I left it in the back, in, in the bag back there. We do have snacks here today. Um, and there are some cookies. Most of them have no nuts. There is one small package with nuts that is separate and some beverage back there. So if you haven't had a chance or want to jump up at any point in time to get some of that, that's fine. Um, and the bakers are Janet Brown, Maureen Sheehan, and me, and I'm Cindy Palmer. I also want to say thank you to Megan Gentile. She's here. She's um, very competent and able to be our tech support person. And um, I appreciate very much she's able to be here today. Also to the First Congregational Church of Southampton who loaned us the LED projector and um, that's of course really helpful and necessary. This is also supported by the town's open space committee and there are several members representing um, a lot of town boards and committees and that's how we've formed. And um, there are several people here from the open space committee. Um, uh, I'd also like to tell you that as part of the grant, we do have to submit a final report. So if you haven't had a chance to sign in, there's a clipboard up here. I don't know if some people got by me here. There's a clipboard where I'm requesting people sign their name and uh, address and email address, if that's helpful, um, to uh, sign that, please. Um, and we do have to give a final report, so we're really glad you're here today. Um, we knew that we couldn't get large numbers of people, basically because of COVID. But uh, as I said, we're, this is going to be available on the East Hampton Media site. Um, I want to say something about the formation of a new organization called Friends of Southampton Open Space. That's a nonprofit. Um, they've applied to become a 501c3 organization. Um, so any donation to them would be tax deductible. And um, that's all forming right now. And you could find their website at f osos.org, uh, and they also have a brand new Facebook page that just came out yesterday. If some of you had a chance to look for that. Thank you. Oh my gosh, those are all my papers flying all over the place. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Yay! Just shove it in there. <laughs> Boy, Mother West Wind, or is this North Wind? Um, so I think that's pretty much it um, for introduction. Uh, let's see here. Our speaker today is Brittany Gudermuth. And Brittany is somebody who is, uh, I'm going to ask her to give her background and, and her qualifications, which are extensive. Her helper is Willow right here. Yay, Willow. Um, I do want to say thank you to my husband. He's holding down the, <laughs> the screen up there. <laughs> Good old Ted, yeah. We, so um, if there's uh, any questions or anything, I don't know, Brittany will explain how she wants to proceed. And I think at this point, we'll jump into what's in your wetland. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Uh, hopefully, we won't blow away. Um, so I am Brittany Gudermuth. I'm the Climate Education Coordinator at Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary which is right in East Hampton. Have, have any of you been there? 
oh, yay. Okay, well, I'm so glad that some of you know about it. For those of you who don't, it's like an eight-minute drive from my house in Southampton to get there, and it's beautiful, tons of different habitats. There's vernal pools and the river and upland forests and wetland forests, and it's just a spectacular place to go. Arcadia is just one sanctuary run by Mass Audubon, which is a statewide organization that protects about 39,000 acres of land throughout the state. And the mission of Mass Audubon is to protect the nature of Massachusetts for people and for wildlife. And so one way we do that is we do education. And so I love to come to events like this to talk to people, what is in your backyard and help you figure out a great way to protect it. So, um, oh, I told, Cindy said she wants me to talk about my credentials. So I've worked at nature centers and zoos and I was a public school teacher for a while. And um, I've done a whole bunch of things that have to do with science education, but this is really my favorite thing to do is to do nature education and specifically public outreach. So, What's in your wetland? Yep, next please. You stood by. There you go. Okay. So, first thing we need to talk about is what is a wetland? How many of you think you've been to a wetland before? Yeah, okay. Good. Most of us hopefully, right? We live in our fantastic state, so many wetlands. Um, so they have a couple very technical definitions, and they have to meet these definitions in order to be protected by what's called the Wetlands Protection Act in our state. So it has to have the presence of plants that are called indicator species. So special plants like the one in the center there, that's a sedge. Um, and they have to be able to grow in saturated or wet conditions. They need soils that lack oxygen. Think about it, if it's got water in it, it means there's not a lot of air there. And so the soils look different in a wetland. And so a wetland scientist could go there, look at the soil and be able to tell, hey, this soil was growing up without any oxygen or very little oxygen. Uh, there's gonna be water near or at the surface during at least some part of the season, the growing season. Um, it can support terrestrial and aquatic life, which we'll see in just a few slides. And then it also has animal indicator species. And these are two of the animals that are flanking the sedge there. The first one is a fairy shrimp. Oh, that big, barely visible to the human eye. And, uh, the, and there is a yellow spotted salamander. Right, Willow? All right, so there are six types of wetlands. Um, the first are marshes, and uh, that's probably what we think of when we think of swamp, right? That's what we picture, is that it would be usually covered in water, and then there are soft stem, like grasses, vegetation coming out. There are vernal pools, which are special types of wetlands because they are isolated. They're just depressions in the ground that fill with the snow melt and the spring rain. There are no fish in vernal pools because by the end of the summer, they usually dry up. This makes them a perfect nursery for animals like frogs and salamanders and those fairy shrimp. There's nothing to eat their eggs. So these are vitally important types of wetlands um, and if you wanna to talk to me afterwards, not protected by the Wetlands Protection Act, and we can talk about why that is and how to get around it. All right, the uh, next type are ponds, and those are the open waters, but the sunlight does reach the whole bottom, so that means that there can be vegetation throughout the whole thing, which makes it different than a lake. Next, Willow. We have swamps. Um, those are saturated soils and uh, with woody plants, so not just the, uh, the soft stem vegetation. The next are bogs. Has anybody been to the Holly Bog? It's in Holly. Amazing place, right? Like sundews and pitcher plants and all those cool carnivorous plants that we talk about, those grow in bogs. And there is really a fantastic example of public access in Holly just to the um, west of us. So check it out if you have time. Um, it's real, the waters are really acidic, and so it supports a really low plant diversity, but again, that's where you're gonna find most of those carnivorous plants. And then fens are like bogs, but they do receive a little bit of outside water, so the water's got a little more nutrients and can support more life. Right, Willow? So where are the wetlands in Southampton? This is a publicly accessible mapping application called Oliver GIS, and anybody can go on this and you can make maps with all kinds of different layers to learn all about your town and our state. And so I went and I searched Southampton 
wetlands. And so all of the blue areas there within the town of Southampton, those are all the wetlands in our town. That's a lot, right? There are a lot of wetlands. And again, if you want more information on how to use this and how to find your home, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. All right. So the question, why am I here? Why do I want us to protect wetlands? We like to play a game at Arcadia called Wetland Metaphors. And we have usually a bucket of things, but we're going to do this on the screen. Um, and I want to know if anyone can figure out an item on the screen and why it's there. What's the metaphor? How is a wetland like a baby bottle? Or, you know, so tell me if you figure one out, raise your hand. Yeah, what do you think? How is it like a sponge? Because usually some marshes, marshes have a, have a lot of grass, and sponges, once they have a lot of water in them, they're kind of squishy. Yes, all right, so the texture, excellent, oh, I love it. Also think about how much water that sponge can hold, right? It's pretty amazing. If we spill on the counter, we can take a sponge and we can mop up like all of the liquid that we spilled. Well, wetlands are like that too. They really help us to hold flood water. So if we just have a river and we don't have wetlands along the side with all of those plants, every time that river floods, that water's gonna head up into our community and cause damage. But because if we're smart enough to leave wetlands and in Southampton, we've done a pretty good job, um, then a lot of that water gets held by the wetland and doesn't cause damage upland. All right, great, thanks for getting us started. What's another one we see? Wanna give him a hint, Willow? We'll just do one. bottle because it is a nursery for animals yeah excellent so oh. wetlands support uh, <laughs> I have a naturalist at my site that says you can't use the word baby animals I'm gonna use it um, so they support a lot of baby animals uh, when they're first starting to grow it's a safer place than out in a river channel or out in a forest so wetlands super important and the food source is right there good all right so far the kids have been brave oh good go for it Six, seven. Uh, a wetland is like an ice bag Wow, I wasn't even going there with that, but that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's actually what the, that's where I was getting with the coal next to it. But that's, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And ab, yeah, the, the, the soil in wetlands in, the, in New England, right, holds 20 to 30% of the world's carbon that's trapped in the, the ecosystems, right? So that's amazing. You know, a lot of times we think about how the forests and the tropical forests are holding all the carbon and keeping climate change at bay, helping us to fight it a little bit. It's actually the wetland soils are doing an immense part of that and helping us combat climate change. Good, the ice pack is also because if we have healthy wetlands, we have vegetation, we have trees growing along rivers and it actually helps to shade those rivers and to keep those waters cool. So that's why the ice pack, good, so there was two there. Go ahead. The sieve, um, cause it's kind of like a natural filtration system to keep things from getting into rivers and other waterways um, and holding them back. Yeah, perfect answer. Yeah, the sieve is there to hold, to filter and hold the sediment specifically before it gets into rivers. Actually, it can even help filter some toxins before it gets into the other waterways. Good. How about a food truck? Anyone figure out the food truck? I was going really literal on this one. What do we think it makes? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, lots and lots of food. <laughs> Excellent. Through the vegetation and also through the animals that live there. And then the last one is a pillow. This one's a little harder. Um, <clears throat> so this is because wetlands are vitally important migration stops for animals. So they're places where animals can stop along their migration route, recharge, refuel, and then can continue on. So really important places, these wetlands that we're so fortunate to have in Southampton. 
All right, so who lives in wetlands besides it being amazing for us? Oh, I should have said on that last slide, those are all examples of something called an ecosystem service. So those are ecosystem services that wetlands provide. And you might hear that when you're talking about wetland science. All right, so who lives in wetlands? Lots and lots of animals. Call out some animals, you see. A turtle. What else? Did I hear people? Ducks. That's right. Excellent. Yeah, that's a marbled salamander. Good. Who's that big one in the bottom right? Beavers. Beavers. Good. Moose. And dragonflies. Yeah, all of the different insects that live there. And then who's in the center? Frogs. All right. So I'm going to argue that frogs are the most iconic wetland species. Um, might be due to the guy up in the top there. Who's that? You saw chipmunks in the wetland? Awesome. Yeah, good. They'll hang out there. Yeah, so Kermit helps us, right, to remember wetlands. Um, and they, the frogs and toads are just amazing. And I'm actually going to focus the rest of this talk on the frogs and toads in Massachusetts because it's really cool for us to know what we have in our backyard. And maybe you guys aren't as nerdy as I am about this, but I love to be able to identify the different species that I'm seeing and hearing throughout the season. So frogs are super important. They're predator and prey in the ecosystem. They provide pest control. They're food for other animals. We're studying them for medicines. There are many medicines that have come from studying frogs and toads. We can do education and research with them, and they're culturally significant. So this little tiny frog is the common coquille frog, and in Puerto Rico, this is, did I just say Puerto Rico? Oh gosh. Okay, I'm gonna skip this because I wanna make sure I have it right. Scratch that. So this is a really important frog, <laughs> culturally, um, and they serve as indicators of environmental health. And so for all those reasons, we love frogs. Unfortunately, they are really sensitive to the environment. They have permeable skin, right? We've all heard that they breathe through their skin. They're amphibians, and they live their life in both land and water, which means that they are exposed to all of the toxins that we could throw at them on land and water, and they are in trouble. Thanks, Willow. Uh, sorry, it's a very text-heavy slide. So over the last 20 years, scientists have noticed a significant decrease in amphibian populations around the world. Um, one out of every third amphibian species is threatened with extinction on Earth. And um, in the United States, just a few years ago, uh, there were 45 species that were on the threatened endangered species list. And uh, we know that's up from up now even. And then there are four species of special concern right here in Massachusetts. Thanks. So the primary causes of these declines are habitat loss, they're losing their homes, pollution, like I said, they breathe through their skin and they get everything, uh, introdu introduction of invasive species, so animals that take over the area and outcompete the animals that were here, parasites and diseases, and climate change are all significantly impacting these species. All right, so now it's time for another activity. Uh, it's, we want to figure out the difference between frogs and toads because they are quite different and there are some, some differences that may even surprise you. So I'm going to say a characteristic and and you guys, you're gonna help us play along, right? Because I know the kids, you guys are way more active than the adults, so nice job, guys. All right, so, and good job, adults, too, for listening, thank you. Uh, so if I say something, and it belongs to a frog, I want you to put both your hands in the air. You put both your hands in the air. So a frog, everybody be quiet. Yeah, all right. Uh, and if it's a toad, do like a little jab hands down here. Yeah, 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 good, okay. All right. All right. So this first one, this animal moves in leaps and hops, in long leaps and hops. Oh, oh, we got it back there. Yes. Excellent, frog. All right. This animal moves in short leaps. Jazz All right, good, good, good. That was a toad. All right, how about this animal lays their eggs in long strings in ponds and wetlands? 
Ooh, long strings. The tricky one. Oh, you got it. Yeah, toads. Yeah, yeah, toads. Good. All right, so then this animal lays their eggs in clumps. Good. Excellent. This animal has smooth, slimy skin. Good, a frog. And this one has drier, bumpier skin. Toad. Good, good, good. All right, you ready? You've done a really good job so far. Here's the hardest one. This animal has teeth. Frog or toad, which one has teeth? <laughs> it's frog. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they have teeth on their upper jaw. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Let's see how you did. Go ahead, Willow. Thank you. All right. Frogs, smooth, slimy skin, lay eggs in clusters, live near water, slim bodies, and that's why they can take those long jumps and upper jaw with teeth. Toads, warty, dry skin, lay eggs in long strands, usually live on uh, dry land after they have their time in the wetland. Fat body, short legs, which means they move in hops, and no teeth. All right, good job, everybody. Next. So we have 10 official local species of frogs and toads in Massachusetts. Now, if you look there, you'll see that it says 11. Well, that's because scientists, and actually it was a community scientist, it was just a person who was helping the scientists do these frog surveys, found that there's a new type of frog that used to live in the Connecticut River Valley that we thought was extirpated, which means that it doesn't live here anymore. Turns out they found one not that long ago. And so we all need to be on the lookout for this new frog, this Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog. All right, go ahead, Willow. So here's where we're going to try to show you the sounds of the different frogs. And um, forgive us, we're going to play with the sound just a little bit and see how it works. So the first one we'll talk about is the American bullfrog. Who's seen or heard one of those before? Yeah, right, yeah. If you've been by a river pond, you've seen it. All right. So the American bullfrog is the biggest frog in, the, um, in North America, but our upper part of North America here. And they can be eight inches, so they're quite large. We call their call the juggerum call. So they say kind of that juggerum, juggerum, really low, really loud, and can be heard over long, long distances. And they, because they're so big, they actually eat fish and other frogs and tons of other things. And you can find them in more faster moving water, like rivers. All right. So our next one, which is closely related to the bullfrog, is the green frog. And uh, the arrow there is pointing to this, what's called a lateral line on the frog. And you'll find this on a lot of animals that live in water. And that's usually about where they stay in the water. That's their level. So when you're looking for green frogs, you just look for that, just the, their back and then their little eyeballs. All right, Willow, try to play it. They are, yeah, yeah. They're not the ones that make such a racket early in the spring, but oh, that's okay. who you're seeing right now. Yep. Those yeah. The those are the wood frogs. Yeah. And the peepers. <laughs> all right. So these sound like a, we call it the banjo frog. It kind of sounds are like a rubber band snapping. These are the green frogs. And they're, you know, the bullfrogs can be like this big. They're like, more like that big. Right, so they're slightly smaller, but they're our second largest frog here, and uh, they can make quite a ruckus. We call that a chorus when they're all calling together. The green frogs and the bullfrogs actually don't start calling until later in the season. So we'll, we'll start to see them now, but they won't be in full chorus. 
uh, looking for mates in order to lay eggs until later in maybe June, July, and that's when we'll really start to hear them. All right, next. Um, and then because they are smaller, they do prefer the less running water, so more like the swamps and the ponds. Okay. Oh, here, I want to tell you something cool about their ears, too. All right. So does everyone see that big round circle behind the eye there? That's the frog's ear. So that's called the tympanic membrane. And it's interesting in green frogs and bullfrogs because you can use the size of this tympanic membrane compared to the size of their eye to tell if they are a male or a female. So if it's larger than the eye, it's a male. And if it's smaller than the eye, it's a female. So what is this? This is a male, excellent, yeah. So these are the ones that are getting to the pools earlier and they start calling in order to attract the females to come lay some eggs. All right, so here's our first toad here. This is the American toad. Um, they are definitely bumpy and drier skin than the frogs and they also have something called a bufotoxin. Has anyone had their dog catch one? No, okay, so you know right away if your dog has caught one because they come in like foaming at the mouth and very unhappy. Um, they're, this toxin actually it can um, make their mouth go numb and it definitely tastes terrible. You wouldn't want to squeeze a toad because they can actually shoot that toxin and it can get in your eye or your mouth and it's not pleasant. All right, so Willow, try to play it. Thank you. All right, so they have that long trill. It's usually about 10 seconds or longer, and we'll start to hear those more and more as the summer goes on. And you can see in this picture that long line of eggs. Those are all the eggs and that string there. Um, and they like can even breed in grassy lawn areas. You'll, you'll see, you'll start to see them. They're the ones that are really, really tiny and black when they first hatch and they, um, they're, it's an emergence and they just tons of them everywhere. Go ahead. All right, so the next toad is the Fowler's toad. Isn't that a funny sound? So oh, my boss at Arcadia likes to say that is the squeeze the baby toad. <laughs> so go ahead, next one. Thank you. So they're smaller, two to three inches, and they very under the ground um, when there's hail or when there's snow or even when it's hot. So they have this digging capability and they like the sandy areas because of that because it's easier to dig into. The next one is an Eastern Spadefoot. Now people used to call this a toad, but it's actually a um, primitive type of frog and it has this interesting little hook on its toe that's also used for digging. vote which one's funnier sounding what do you think the fowlers or the spade foot spade foot <laughs> um, the fowlers and the spade foot they're both less common uh, especially in Southampton here so it's a real treat if you get to hear if you get to see them they're much smaller east eastern spade foots can be really tiny um, and 
they, again, that little hook that they have, and they do live in soils. All right, yep. So the next one is one of a trio, and these can all be very easily confused, but that's okay. It's good to know at least what we, what we have, what we could hear. This one's called the pickerel frog. So the pickerel is kind of like a snore, and that's the way that we identify it. Yeah, good. Um, so they tend to be browner than the next one I'll show you, and their spots are really irregular. They're not, you couldn't call them any one shape, um, and you'll see that along their back there. And they like the slower moving waters. They actually have this crazy toxic secretion in their skin that if you have them in a terrarium with another frog, it will kill all the other frogs because it's so toxic. So don't, like if you guys like to catch and look at frogs and then release them, of course, release them, right? You would not want to put this one in a bucket with another frog. It would not be kind. All right, so here's, the northern leopard frog, which looks really similar. They tend to be greener, and we can kind of say that their spots look like rectangles. Like if we were going to classify them, that's how we'd classify them. So that one even kind of sounds like the pickerel frog, where it's that snore, but the key is it's got those clucks afterwards. So it's the snore followed by a series of clucks, and that's how you can tell the difference if you can't see them. Remember, these guys call at night because that's when they do their best breeding. And so you might not even see what's making the call. So it's good to know both things, what they look like and what they sound like. The northern leopard frogs can get quite big, and they um, eat a lot of things, basically everything that swims by and they could fit in their mouth, they will eat it. Um, they're really funny. If you've ever seen one up on the water's edge and they thinks you're a predator, they'll scream and jump in the water and then turn super fast to try to evade the predator. So they're just really fun to watch. So here's this new frog. Here's the Atlantic Coast leopard frog. It looks really similar to the leopard frog that we just saw um, with some differences. You can see that the spots are smaller and also more spread out. And that tends to be, um, that's how they look. So you can, individual to individual, you can bet on that. So that's more of just the chuck. So remember the leopard frog was the snore followed by the chuck afterwards. This is just the chuck part. So that might help. All right, go ahead, Will. Great. So here's another one that you might have seen or heard. This is the gray tree frog. Now, gray tree frogs, wait, what color is that frog? That, that frog is green. It turns out that gray tree frogs can actually change color. And they do so to camouflage or to blend in with their surroundings to avoid being eaten or to be avoid being seen by what they want to eat. So um, you may see the same tree frog on your deck and it might be gray and then you'll see it over on your trees and it might be green. It might even look a little brownish and that's the hyla versicolor, right? Versicolor meaning they can change color. Can you play this? You said you hear them. Where do you hear them? We hear them near our mouth. Nice. And it's like, it was, it was like, it's so, they're really loud. Yes. Oh, you're 
you're so lucky. Awesome. Yes, when you find them in your pool after you take the cover off after the winter, <laughs> they'll be bright green, beautiful little frogs. And you can see too that they have pads on their toes that help them climb virtually any surface. Uh, they do have a hard time with those wet pool walls, however. Um, and so they will spend their time in the wetlands and then they live up in the trees. When you hear them calling, you'll hear them calling up off the ground. And that's the difference between the toads and the American toad and the gray tree frog sound really similar, right? But this is a shorter trill and you'll hear it up high as opposed to the American toad, which will be lower and um, it's a longer trill. All right, next. Bring deeper. So who's heard a spring peeper before? Like all of us, right? It's like the sound of summer and spring here. That's right. You can see that they also have the pads, so we know that they can climb up in the trees as well. Um, and they will, they really will call pretty much all season long. If you were paying attention and if the speakers were working, you could hear that they've crashed almost every other sound recording because they just are calling all the time. <laughs> really, really tiny and excellent camouflage for the leaves on the ground. All right, so our last one here is the wood frog, and this is the one you're asking about. This is the one that we hear first. This means spring in Southampton, is when we first start hearing these wood frogs. We can identify them because they have the black mask, and if we hear wood frogs, it means we have that special type of wetland called the vernal pool. They're an obligate breeder in those pools. That's the only place they breed. If we hear them, we have a vernal pool. So let's listen to them. All right, ducks quacking is what they sound like. The way that we know uh, the difference between the two, ducks don't usually quack like that at night, right? But the nighttime is when these are going to be calling the most. And so that's when you'll hear them and be able to find them. Um, they are very small and they enjoy uh, being in the woodlands and open grasslands even. And they, again, they have to breed in those vernal pools. Um, they are the only frog that you can find above the Arctic Circle. They have this amazing ability to not, or to actually to be able to freeze solid in the winter and then thaw and not die. Like, that's amazing. Think about it like if you have a frozen strawberry that's been in your freezer and you take it out to make a smoothie and the phone rings or you forget, you have to walk the dog. You come back, that strawberry is just a puddle on the counter, right? Everyone's been there, they're mushy. All right, so that is what would happen to most living things if they froze solid and then thawed, right? Because water expands when it freezes and it will explode the cells that the, the water is in. Um, but these wood frogs, they have this amazing almost antifreeze quality to their cells to their, and the liquid in their cells and they can thaw and be fine. And scientists are studying this for a whole host of um, different applications, but just very cool stuff. Go ahead. All right, so those are the 11 species of frogs and toads in Massachusetts. And the last question I have is how can we help frogs and toads and wetlands? So the first thing is to stop this habitat loss that's the number one reason for the decline of amphibians all over the world. We need to protect our wetlands. In Massachusetts, we have the Wetlands Protection Act. 
in Southampton, we just passed a bylaw with a 25-foot no-build zone, and that is huge. That is going to help the wetlands of Southampton. That's going to help all the wildlife here, and it's going to help the people too. So this is really important step that our town has taken, said we know that wetlands are important and we're going to protect them. But as homeowners, we can do this too, right? We can say like, oh, we have a wetland, we have a marsh where we hear peepers and tree frogs and uh, we wanna protect them. All right, um, also to protect vernal pools, again, I'll talk to you uh, later if you wanna learn more about certifying vernal pools that aren't part of wetland systems already. The second thing we can do is we can keep, keep chemicals off of our lawns. We need to forget the pesticides. Crabgrass is grass too, you know. Um, the more different types of plants we have growing, the better it is for everyone, for pollinators, as well as for all the animals that are using the, the wetlands. Um, we also need to make sure that we're recycling our oil, our motor oil, and also other wastes properly so that they're not getting into our wetland systems. The last thing that you can do, well, there's lots you can do. The last thing I'm gonna talk about that you can do is you can join a community science project like Frog Watch USA. Yeah, so Frog Watch USA is an example of a community science product, uh, project that was run by the Association of Zoos and Aquarias. And um, it's been hosted for over 20 years now through local chapters. And we have a local chapter right out of Arcadia. It's the Connecticut River Valley, uh, River Valley Frog Watch chapter. And if you're interested in joining, come talk to me. We do a training every single spring. You've already missed it for this year, but that's okay. All the trainings are online this year because of COVID. Um, so you can still catch up and there's still lots of data to take. And uh, you can also speak with me and I'll, I'll help you out. And it collects data on frogs and toads in order to help identify them and to protect them. So next. All right, so with that, I thank you and I welcome any questions.